Well, I have a confession to make before I start the message. Um, and uh, it is this, and there are, I think, a number of preachers in our congregation or, or retired preachers. It's this, that sometimes sermon topics are hard to come by. And um, there are some weeks when they just sort of roll out and they're great, and then there are others where you have to dig and dig and dig and nothing seems to come. Well, this week I was reading feverishly trying to get that topic that would be just right for the summer. And uh, Wednesday came along and George here, he wanted to know what I was preaching on so he, so he could choose some hymns and... Um, June was doing the uh, setting up the power, the PowerPoint or the easy worship slides, and she wanted to know some things and what I was doing. And Wednesday came and went, and Thursday, Thursday late afternoon, June sends me a text, and she said, "So, asked very politely, do we have a, a scripture for for uh, for easy worship?" And I said, "Well." As soon as the Lord gives me one, I will let you know. <laughs> and she replied, sorry, sounds like someone is more than ready for a holiday. <laughs> and after a few texts went back and forth about why that might be so, um, uh, June, and by the way, I had June's permission to share this. Um, June said, well, maybe a sermon topic for you would be the need for a rest. And it was spelt A-R-R-E-S-T. <laughs> and after I got my mind past visions of police stations, I, I, and she said a couple other things, I got her point that sometimes we all need to regroup and breathe and have a rest two words, and uh, she said, even the Lord rested on the seventh day, and I, I said to June, maybe you're on to something, and uh, I started to work with it, and as I worked with it, a little jingle from the past entered my head, and uh, it was a, a television ad that uh, was prominent um, shortly after I came to Canada, I think, and it kind of stuck in my head. I wonder if you know which company it is, if I sing it. You deserve a break today at? McDonald's. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> at McDonald's. McDonald's. And, uh, you know, I struggle to go to McDonald's now, but back then, fresh off films like American Graffiti and uh, TV shows like uh, Happy Days, many a young person would spend their Friday and Saturday nights cruising around McDonald's, and there are a couple here from Brampton this morning, and that's the one that I was cruising around in my late teenage years on Queen Street. But, 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 if you really need a break, you probably need more than McDonald's. I don't know if this is the busiest age ever, but many people are, are feeling very busy and feeling stress. And they used to call New York the city that never sleeps. I think Frank Sinatra sang about it. Um, in the last few years, I have thought that Toronto seems to have joined the party. And it doesn't seem to matter what day or what time of the night you, or day you go in there, but if you're on those 400 class highways, there's so much traffic, and many times it's backed up. It's crazy. What once was rush hour is now rush three or four hours in the morning and the evening. And uh, it's just a crazy place. Computers. Computers. Supposed to help us and give us more free time. But businesses, being businesses, have generally used computers to get rid of support staff and the cutbacks associated with that and other things, it's just meant that work has been piling up on the individuals who are working, and uh, businesses are expecting more from less, and workers are feeling pressure, and more and more pressure to produce and produce. 
I've got object lessons today, you know. Um, these things. There's always this. We're supposed to be, you know, have time to ourselves at times, but these things, with these, we're always available for emails, and texts, and, and pressure wherever we go. And uh, this line between work and personal life has become blurred because of it. Experts are saying that stress levels are rising. And the expectations are so high. In Japan, for instance, that um, one woman uh, six or seven months ago, a young woman, uh, actually died from overwork and stress in the few weeks leading up to her, her it was suicide actually, um, she apparently put in 105 hours of overtime and that led to a reevaluation by the company of, of work expectations. The CEO resigned over it. There's a word even in Japanese for this, karoshi, which means death from overwork. Well, as I continued thinking about this topic, I recognized that our congregation at Eastminster, there are a lot of people that aren't working any longer. And I thought about their lives. And I thought about how so many people who are retired tell me that they're busier in retirement than they were in their working lives. And I, I don't know how you find it, but there are some people, they'll take on a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And, um, and then, you know, at first it seems okay, but maybe other things come along and maybe um, one of the children goes through a separation. And you wind up with a child back home and maybe grandchildren to look after. Or maybe a loved one has a health concern and you wind up spending way more time in the hospital than you want to. Um, all sorts of things can happen, and um, these things can, can take up our time, they can sap our strength. I, I remember one woman in uh, a congregation I had in Ottawa, and she worked, actually worked part-time as an administrator. Uh, her father had a stroke, and uh, she was the only family that he had. And... Um, she was very dedicated and looked after him for a number of years. And I remember going to see her about two years in, and she told me how exhausted she was. She said she went to work, and when she wasn't at work, she went to the, the long-term care facility that he was in, and she would feed her father because the support staff didn't seem to do that. Um, she would shave him every day or two, comb his hair, try to get his arms and legs moving, and, and then in the evening she would just kind of try to struggle with him, move him to a chair, and she would sit with him. And it went on day after day after day. And it drained her. She needed a break. Carol needed time. She needed rest. Uh, and I'm sure that there are many here who can empathize, because any one of a hundred different things we do them and keep doing them and keep doing them. They can just drain us of, of life and vitality. And we need breaks, not just McDonald's. We need changes to our routine and time away, a time to regroup, a time to refocus, just plain rest. Probably not the most obvious use of this particular scripture passage but if you happen to note at the beginning of it, just before the, the feeding of the 5,000, the disciples have come back after uh, some time out on the road, and they were taking the gospel, and they were, they were uh, healing and, and, and talking to people about the gospel. And it was a busy, busy mission trip, and they were hungry, and they were tired. And Jesus says this, come away by yourselves to a lonely place and rest a while. And there's a similar situation in, in John chapter 6, in the middle of a critical time of Jesus' own ministry, 
uh, of preaching and healing and interacting with people, we read Jesus had to withdraw to the mountains by himself to be alone. Fred van Tattenhofer. I asked some of my Dutch friends how this is said. Tattenhofer. Um, he used to teach at Asbury Theological Seminary where I studied uh, my basic theology degree. And, and he said that in his humanity, Jesus had to find time for solitude. He had to walk away sometimes from people who were hurting and people who were sick and people who were troubled just to revitalize his own physical and emotional and spiritual well-being. Just like we can be troubled by stresses in our lives. He suggests that for Jesus, the strain of this continuous pulls and demands on his life were something else. People were always wanting a piece of him. And his reputation as a healer, his reputation as a teacher, people were always coming in and talking to him, and they wanted him. Um, even when he was alone with the dis disciples, they're always asking questions, questions, more questions. And so sometimes Jesus even needed to step aside, recharge. Solitude seems to be essential even for Jesus even for his disciples. And it's not just total rest in the sense of doing nothing. When we read some of these passages in the gospel, it's interesting that Jesus would take that time to pray and interact with God, associate with the Father in heaven. And so, I'm wondering this morning if Jesus needed time to catch his breath and to withdraw from the passing lane of life, how much more we need it? How much more do we need those times away? But Tatanova says, too many of us are out of balance between giving and taking and work and rest and activity and solitude. We need to take time for ourselves and, and time in which we can just be and meet with God. He said this coming apart that Jesus refers to, this resting a while, it's not just a luxury, but it's a necessity for us. He says, come apart, as Jesus said, or fall apart. Some other verses jumped out at me. Some years ago, uh, in the film Chariots of Fire, that film deals with the stories of Eric Little and um, William Abrams, uh, Harold Abrams, uh, on their trip to the 1924 Olympics in Paris. Little, if you know the story, was supposed to run the 100 meters. Problem it was 1924, and. One of the heats was on Sunday. A staunch Scottish Presbyterian, little refused to run on the Sabbath. And in spite of intercession by none other than the Prince of Wales, little followed the Sabbath commandment. And he took the day, and he went, and he even spoke at the Church of Scotland in Paris on this text. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And a day later, one of his friends who had already won a medal stepped aside, and that allowed little to be entered into the 400 meters. Things were a little lighter then in terms of regulations at the Olympics that he entered the 400. He wasn't supposed to win. Highly favored American runners. Um, it wasn't his race, it wasn't his distance. But just before the race, the American uh, runner, Jackson Schultz, put a note in his hand and that note supported him because of his convictions and, uh, that he had uh, taken the Sabbath commandment seriously and taken the rest. 
And maybe because of it, he went out and he ran the race of his life. And if you've seen the movie, put the head back and just ran. And he won the gold. And he was lauded throughout all Britain, but especially in Scotland. (laughs) He'd been faithful. Faithful to God's, taking God's rest. And I think God put that idea of the seventh day in his book for a reason. And good reason. And beyond Sabbath observances. Jesus seems to recognize the need of of breaks, breaks in which we can rest, in which we can recharge. And I think these two verses come together. Come away to a deserted place, all by yourselves, and rest a while. And they, those that wait upon the Lord, shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So the word for today is be kind to yourself.